to be back with you this morning and uh, I wanted to speak to a few of you this morning. Those of you that I haven't, I apologise and hopefully I will uh, be able to grab you uh, before you leave at the end of the service um, just to have a catch up and see how you are. Um, but it's lovely to be back and let's turn our focus and our minds onto worshipping our Saviour, our risen Christ. So I'd like to invite us to join in with our call to worship this morning and for you to join in with the words that are involved. So let us gather together with hearts united, drawn together by the bonds of faith and the spirit of unity. The early believers were in one heart and mind, sharing all they had creating a harmonious melody of love. As we enter this sacred space, let us embrace the spirit of generosity and communal love, just as the early Christians did in Jerusalem. May our worship be a reflection of this fellowship and unity, where no one claimed private ownership, but all things were held in common. In this shared sacred moment, let us open our hearts to the transformative power of the Holy Spirit, who, mom, who moves among us, binding us together in love. Let our worship be a symphony of selfless love, echoing the chorus of the early believers testifying to the resurrection power of our Lord Jesus Christ. May our worship today be a testimony to the boundless hope, joy, grace and faith 
that unites us over distance and time. One body, one family, gathered in love. Amen. So I'd like to invite you to stand as you're able to sing together freely, freely. O Creator God, we come before you in prayer, our hearts overflowing with gratitude and thanksgiving for the precious gift of unity and fellowship. We thank you, Lord, for the bond that unites us as a community of believers. Like the precious oil that flowed down Aaron's beard, we acknowledge the anointing of your spirit covering us with grace, love, and the assurance of your presence. We're grateful for the refreshing dew, as on Mount Hermon, symbolising the life-giving essence of our shared faith. Your grace descends upon us, bringing renewal, strength, and a sense of connectedness. We thank you, Father, the harmonious symphony created when we, your children, live for each other, no matter our differences. In our diversity, you weave a tapestry of love, of understanding and compassion, echoing the beauty of your kingdom on earth. And as we reflect on the goodness of unity, we offer our thanksgiving for the moments of laughter, of hope, of happiness, of togetherness, of comfort, of strength, and the ability to share the weight of our burdens, all of which is found in genuine fellowship. 
Your presence among us, Lord, brings harmony to our gatherings and peace and joy to our hearts. May our gratitude be expressed not only in words, but also in our actions towards one another. Empower us to love sincerely, to forgive readily, and to bear each other's burdens willingly, embodying the harmony that the word we heard here today celebrates. Thank you, Lord, for the precious gift of unity, a gift that reflects the essence of your nature. We're grateful for the fellowship that we share as brothers and sisters in Christ, bound together by the love that surpasses all understanding. Gracious and merciful God, we come before you with humble hearts, acknowledging the doubts that linger within us and the moments when our faith wavers. In the stillness of this sacred place, we confess our shortcomings and we seek your forgiveness. Like the disciples in the locked room, we sometimes find ourselves paralysed by fear. Fear of the unknown. Fear of inadequacy. And fear of the challenges that lie ahead. In those moments we have doubted your presence and questioned your plans for us. Lord, forgive us for the times we have struggled to fully trust in your resurrection power. Forgive us for the moments when we have allowed doubt to overshadow the profound truth of your victory over death. And in the spirit of Thomas, we confess that there are times when we demand tangible evidence, seeking assurance in what we can see and touch rather than trusting in the unseen reality of your love and grace. We repent of our limited vision and ask for the faith to believe without always needing to see. Grant us strength to embrace the blessedness of those who trust in your word without demanding visible proof. Lord Jesus, just as you showed your wounds to Thomas, reveal to us the areas in our lives where healing and transformation are needed. Make us aware of the woundedness around us and guide us in acts of compassion, mercy and reconciliation. May the same spirit that breathes peace into the locked room, breathe forgiveness and renewal into our hearts today. Empower us to go forth with courage, sharing the good news of your resurrection and embodying the love that casts out fear. We offer this prayer in the name of the risen Christ, who continues to transform doubt into faith, and darkness into everlasting light. Amen. As we continue in prayer, we pray together the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Amen. I'd like to invite us to stand as we're able and sing together that he is risen.
please be seated, that's fine, um, that I have been moving around a little bit and doing a little bit and uh, bringing the young people to the front. Um, and so our story today, you might guess, might be about a um, story in a locked room, the story of a certain person. And we're going to come on to that a little bit later. But first of all, I want to show you something. Okay, so I've already asked down here if we know what this is. So we know, what's this? Money. Yeah, and what sort of money is it? A five pound note. Yes, lots of money, isn't it? Buy lots with that, can't you? Yeah. So I've got a five pound note, folks. Five pound note. And I've also got a red paper clip. And I've got a green paper clip. Okay. I am going to use my five pound note to enable me to ensure that these two paper clips come together without me touching them. Do you think that's possible? No? Don't believe me? Do you believe me? No? They're all the parents are shaking their heads saying they don't believe me. They don't think this can happen. Okay, so let's pressure's on, first day back, and all that. All that jazz. So here we go. Let's give it a go. Let's see if I can get my notes with my paper clips. So as you can see, my paper clips are nowhere near each other. Let's just get these things. and my two paper clips. And you're saying, hands up if you think that I'm going to be able to join them together without touching them. So some of you think I can now. I should never have asked the question. So here we go. Girls, come and, come and pick them up. Come and see. Are they going together? Pick them up. Can I hold them up high? They're going to see. Can you see? Yeah, come up onto the steps so they're going to see them. You, you stand on the steps. You can stand on the steps. That's it. And then you hold that up nice and high. Look at that. <laughs> How cool is that? She cries at me every time she sees me. I've got a smile today. Bonus. They were really scared of the people who had killed Jesus. 
But suddenly, Jesus appeared. He was there in that room. And it was really hard to believe. But they saw him. They really did. They saw him. And Jesus showed them their wounds in their side, in his side and in his hands. So they knew that it was him. But one of the disciples, whose name was Thomas, wasn't with them. He wasn't there, so he didn't see Jesus. And so when they told Thomas, Thomas just didn't believe. He just did not believe them. He'd seen Jesus die, and he'd seen Jesus buried. So how could Jesus be alive? Thomas said that until I see it for real myself, then I'm not going to believe. Then a week later, the disciples were in another lock room again, but this time Thomas was with them. Jesus came and stood among them again. Jesus said to Thomas, come here and put your finger here. See my hands, reach out and put it in my side. Stop doubting and... Believe! Thomas fell on his knees and answered Jesus, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Super. So to those of you who believed my paper clips who could go together without seeing, you had faith in me that I could do it. Those of you that thought I couldn't, well, I don't blame you. So we're going to, well done girls, that's fantastic. I loved your believe faces, they were brilliant. So we're going to sing again together. Feel free to um, yeah. feel free to go back into the chorus if you want to. Feel free to have a jig and a dance if you want to to the next hymn. That's completely up to you. Um, but before we do that, let's have a very quick prayer. So, dear God, help us to believe in our heart the truths that we find in your holy word, even though we've not seen them with our own eyes. Help us to believe. In Jesus' name. Amen. So let's sing together. Alleluia. Give thanks to the risen Lord. Oh, mm-hmm. 
of what we have heard this morning. Our reading is taken from John 20, verses 19 to 31. It was late that Sunday evening, and the disciples were gathered together behind locked doors because they were afraid of the Jewish authorities. Then Jesus came and stood among them, Peace be with you, he said. After saying this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were filled with joy at seeing the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father sent me, so I send you. Then he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive people's sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. One of the twelve disciples, Thomas, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. Thomas said to them, Unless I see the scars of the nails in his hands, and put my finger in those scars, and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, the disciples <coughs> were together again indoors, and Thomas was with them. The doors were locked, but Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, and look at my hands. Then reach out your hand, and put it in my side. Stop your doubting and believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Do you believe because you see me? How happy are those who believe without seeing me? In his disciples' presence, Jesus performed many other miracles, which are not written down in this book. But these have been written in order that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through your faith in him, you may have life. Thanks be to God. Thanks, Jill. So while I've been off on Sundays where I've been feeling okay, I've attended other churches. And on Easter morning, I attended a church that had multiple services. It was a large church uh, with varying congregations uh, because it was, it was so big. Um, and it was very much like this church where there was very, very little parking around the, uh, around the area. I won't say too much more about the parking around here. But the church had um, a parking team. So like we have a welcome team, etc. They had a parking team. And the parking team guided me on that day to a, an available parking space. Very useful if you don't know the area, you don't know where you're allowed to park, where you're not allowed to park, etc. But the biggest challenge for the parking team was in between the two services because they would have the car park spaces would obviously be full and then they'd have people coming along to the second service where some people might try and leave early and go but then swapping over places and what just weren't enough spaces to for both both amount of cars for both services around so it became a real um, problem for them so the minister, um, I was chatting to them, saying, what a lovely problem to have that you've got all these, all these people coming and all these cars and et cetera, et cetera. But she explained to me that the, that the biggest problem is the spaces that are nearest the sanctuary. So obviously they have, although there are people of all ages, there are people who need to be close to the sanctuary because of disabilities or needing to be able to be close and it was a real issue because those spaces were always full. Those spaces were usually the folk that came early to the first service and were often later leaving the second service because they wanted to miss the hustle and bustle of the changeover. 
But on one occasion, this parking volunteer noticed that there was a car that was backing out of one of the spaces that was right next to the sanctuary. And it was a prime spot. It was a real good parking spot. A bit like probably the one I get when the one around here is free. And I go, oh, yes. And his car was backing out of it. And the, the volunteer was just absolutely delighted. He was like, oh, that's, that's amazing. And at the same time, he saw another car coming down the road, approaching him. And he noticed that it was an older lady on her own. And he thought, wow, that's wonderful. I'm going to be able to help this lady get probably one of the most desirable prime spots next to the church on Easter morning. This is just, I'm going to make her day. She's obviously come at a time because she wanted to be able, thought she'd have to drive around a bit to be able to get a place. So the parking volunteer began enthusiastically waving the lady on to... You know, a bit like on the airport runway, a bit of this and a bit of that. Parking volunteer was like, come on, come on, come on. And the lady apparently sort of like was looking a bit confused. And the parking volunteer thought, well, she obviously doesn't think there's a space because there's never a space here. But so he carried on doing a bit more energetically and jumping around and come on, come and get this spot. It's for you. Finally, the lady got it and she came and she parked in that space and the parking volunteer walked up to the car to wish her a happy Easter and to say good morning, take her and help her get out of the car and welcome her to the service, etc. And the lady rolled down her window instead of opening the door. She still looked a bit confused and she said, I don't go to this church. I've been a member of the Baptist church down the street for over 60 years. But the road down there is closed, so we've been redirected this way. Oh. The minister said that the parking attendant volunteer had never been so embarrassed in his whole life. But he got so excited about bringing this lady so much joy and excitement on Easter morning that actually he'd taken her in the wrong direction completely. Have you ever felt like that? Not that you've gone in the wrong parking space, but have you ever felt like you've been guided or manoeuvred and parked some place where you really didn't want to be? Maybe you feel like you were parked in a location or parked in a job or parked in an idea that hasn't really taken you where you wanted to be or where you needed to be. The truth is a lot of us are taught notions and beliefs and then we park our minds there. But maybe we should keep going and keep searching and keep exploring I wouldn't be stood here today had I not done that searching and exploring at college. I think I've said to you before, my theology, my beliefs before I went into college were very, very, very different to what they are now. Because I explored, I dig, dug deep and researched what I think and what I think God was speaking to me about what I think the Bible is saying to us today. Many of us have parked our minds already around the understanding of who Jesus' disciples were, particularly Thomas. Today we're focusing on Thomas. How many of us think of Thomas as doubting Thomas? How many of you have taught in Sunday school about doubting Thomas? That's what I knew to Thomas as, doubting Thomas. 
Thomas doubted Jesus' resurrection. Therefore, he had the name Doubting Thomas. But the more that I've studied and the more that I've looked into it and the more that I've experienced, the more I dislike being manoeuvred into that parking space. And the more that I want to change my opinion of Thomas. And there's three things that I'd like to point out about this old familiar story of doubting Thomas. That I hope will help us to not park our beliefs prematurely. The first one is that I hope that we see from Thomas's story is that doubt isn't always such a bad thing. Doubting Thomas was always negative. Oh, we can't be like doubting Thomas, because he doubted that's not the right thing to do. We mustn't be like that disciple, be like the others. Doubt is not bad. If we look at the lives of great prophets and saints, from Jeremiah through to Mother Teresa... There's plenty of evidence of doubt. It's not uncommon at all. It's there. In all its greatness, in all the faithful lives. I do wonder if it's possible to really possess the fullness of a great and vigorous faith unless we have grappled with doubt. Unless we have examined our doubt whether we have struggled with it, whether we have worked through it. It's also been said that Jesus was a doubter. This, this really surprised me as I was researching for today. It was lovely. I'm only on 15 hours a week at the moment, so that meant I could spend a long time researching for today and really digging deep into the scriptures. And this I found really profound that Jesus was a doubter and it says that at least he knew how to employ his doubt creatively for the life of faith he doubted that anger and violence were ways to resolve differences so he said forgive one another He doubted that the long prayers and the rigid dietary laws and cleanliness codes of his religious tradition were essential to faith. So he talked about practicing an honest, simple, trusting faith. He doubted that Samaritans were of less inherent worth than others. So he told the parable about the good Samaritan and the neglectful priest. So maybe, just maybe, the capacity to doubt is the prelude to establishing vital, meaningful, faithful commitments. How many of us have had the privilege of struggling with a few faith-shaping doubts of our own? If we're honest... Probably most of us. I'm not going to stand here and say that I haven't had my own doubts. Beautiful. So if we have our doubts, then we must have some sympathy and some respect for Thomas. The biblical story of Thomas is only found in the reading we had today in the Gospel of John. And by the time John writes, by the time it's written, it's 70 years after Jesus' death. It's written at a time when the Jewish and the Gentile Christians were experiencing tremendous persecution from the Romans. And it's almost certain that the Christians were doubtful. 
practically all the time about the wisdom of having adopted the faith. The risks were massive, they were huge. Many of them were tempted to go into hiding. They had to for their own protection. And with that backdrop, we can see why the author of John's Gospel would have found it meaningful to tell that story to that very first group of Jesus' followers. It was important that that was written down. They were doubtful. They were doubtful about their futures. They were tempted to go into hiding. They were huddled in an upstairs room, locked away securely behind closed doors. And there was Thomas. Thomas was doubtful because he couldn't see for himself. He couldn't touch. He wanted proof. He wanted proof of exactly what others were telling him. And what's wrong with that? Sometimes that's what we need, isn't it? We need, we need solid proof. We need evidence. Particularly if we're scientific in our in our mindset, if we, you know, we can't all be creative, you know, if we're scientific, we need, we need to know. A plus B equals C. Well, if we've got A and we can't see what B is, then how on earth are we meant to know what C is? But faith doesn't work like that. Thomas is a transition point. Thomas demands for proof. Jesus actually gives him proof. Jesus gives him what he needs. He lets him see and he lets him touch. But then Jesus goes on to say, for the benefit of all of us who will follow Thomas and hear of this story, blessed are those who have not seen and yet who have come to believe. And that line, that one line is intended for us. For us, 2,000 years later, those of us that can't see, those of us who can't verify, those of us that can't amass proof, yet are invited to the blessings of faith in Jesus Christ. Sometimes we have to ask ourselves, what do we need to believe? How is it possible for us to believe if we don't get what the disciples and ultimately even Thomas got? What is the basis of our belief? I love this story. Father Henry Nguyen shared about his experience that helped him with just those questions that I've just asked. He was a fan of the flying Rodleys who were German trapeze artists. And Nguyen was a Catholic priest. And he says that he greatly admired the acrobats and he befriended them. And he even let them and even let him practice with them on the trapeze. Well, he was brave, wasn't he? So, once Nguyen recalls, he asked the leader of the troop about flying through the air. So, have a, have a think, trapeze artists. Just imagine them in here. I'd rather not. And he said, as a flyer, I must have complete trust in my catcher. The public might think that I'm a great star of the trapeze. But the real star is Joe, my catcher. He has to be there for me with split-second precision and grab me out of the air. I have simply to stretch out my arms and hands and wait for him to catch me. The worst thing the flyer can do is try to catch the catcher. A flyer must fly and a catcher must catch. And the flyer must trust with outstretched arms that his catcher 
will be there for him. Don't we live like the flyer on the trapeze? We're spinning and we're swirling through life, unable to see where we're headed. We can't see or touch or prove the existence of a catcher who won't let us fall. But nevertheless, we learn to reach out our hands and believe that we'll be so safely caught and safely held. Blessed are those who cannot see, yet who have come to believe. Because sometimes, reaching out in faith, unseeingly, but trustingly, is really the only way open to each and every one of us. Amen. We're going to remain seated as we pray together. And we're going to sing, Father, hear the prayer we offer. While this uh, hymn, no, we'll do the offertory, we'll do the offertory after. We'll just remain seated to sing, Father, hear the prayer we offer. and to allow them to flourish. Open hearts, time, love, forbearance, honesty and an attitude of generous giving. We all give of our time, our talents and treasure to build communities and sometimes we must give without counting the cost. 
The charities and causes that we wish to support suffer from the cost of living crisis, as do we, many of us, all of us, sat here. Jesus' peace allows us to relax and not worry, but doesn't absolve us to the need to give. So this is our time to give again of our time, to give of ourselves, and to give of our finances. Some will have given already through direct debit, through bank transfers. We give too for Leveson, for the Might Scheme, and for the Ukraine missions. So we give thanks for all that is given to build up our church here, to build up our community, and to build up the worldwide church. Let's take the buckets round. So we continue in a time of prayer as we think of others in our community, in our world. So gracious God, as we lift our hearts in prayer, we intercede on behalf of your beloved children, recognising the challenges and joys that shape our shared journey of faith. We pray for those who, like the disciples, may be wrestling with doubt or fear. May the light of your truth dispel the shadows, bringing reassurance and peace. Strengthen their faith and grant them the courage to walk boldly in your light. Lord, we intercede for those burdened by the weight of unconfessed sins. May the spirit of confession and repentance bring healing and restoration. Shower them with the assurance of your forgiveness, cleansing them from all unrighteousness. 
We lift up those who long for genuine fellowship within the community of believers. May your spirit foster unity, understanding and love, creating a bond that reflects the beauty of the fellowship the early church aspired to. May our shared life be a testimony to the transformative power of your grace. We intercede for those who feel isolated or lonely, yearning for connection. Wrap them in the warmth of your love and guide us to be instruments of companionship and support. May we actively seek out those in need and extend the hand of friendship. Lord, we bring before you the broken relationships within our communities. Heal wounds, reconcile hearts, and inspire forgiveness. May the love that binds us together overcome any discord. And may our unity reflect the unity found in your nature. We pray for those facing adversity, illness, or distress. Embrace them with your comforting presence and grant them strength to endure. Use us, your church, as channels of your love, bringing practical help and compassion to those in need. In our intercession, we remember those who have not yet encountered the fullness of your light. Illuminate their hearts and minds, drawing them into the fellowship of believers. May our lives be living testimonies, inviting others to be into the transformative relationship found in Christ. And now, Lord, we bring before you the names and situations that lie heaviest on our hearts. We pray for Rod and for Glenis. For Mary, for Kate, for Gordon and family. And in a moment of silence, we pray for those known to us but not mentioned in our prayer book. Lord, as we intercede for these needs, we place our trust in your boundless love and mercy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we come to our final hymn this morning and I'd like to invite us to stand and to sing together Come People of the Risen King. Oh, 
knitting us together by the love of Christ. May our bonds of fellowship be strong and our understanding of each other deep. Let us share our purpose unwaveringly. So in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit, may the peace, grace, strength, joy and love given so freely by God, be our constant companion. Not to be kept, but to be offered in fellowship and shared with all whom we meet. Amen. <laughs> 